really dirty. And it's a um, community we're in there, like, a lot of people live there. Probably that's the reason why they're not allowed to drink the tap water. Um, I just want to share something. In Kagan, the RCD, um, there are different kinds of water uh, district. But if I have learned in our uh, mountains, um, there's a river, I don't know, it's not a river. Um there's a stream and in inside the stream um, there's a cave. A cave has um, has an opening where water water cap comes out and then people would go there and use that water as their drinking water. And I have lived there for how many how many days because of activities and then I learned that it is safe because not because of experimentation because I drink it and I, and I find it much more fresh than distilled water. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. I think what this young man said about um, marketing and water bottles, it's a huge issue, you know, back in, in the, I, I don't know, the 70s, when they first came out with plastic water bottles and, you know, oh, it's so convenient, look at all these beautiful people drinking this bottled water, and, you know, and then it became the norm, but norms always change over time. Especially here on campus, I see more and more people carrying around reusable water bottles where, you know, in the 90s, you didn't see that. And so I think that, you know, we're starting kind of this um, shift in the way we perceive bottled water versus tap water. And as more and more people gain access to tap water, and as more and more regulations are enforced, not only put in place, but those have to be enforced, and you need to hold that private company or the government, whoever controls your tap water, you need to hold them accountable for keeping that water quality. And you know, the more we do this and the more we educate our neighbors and our friends about you know, our rights to that water, you know, you're paying for that water, despite whether it comes out of your tap or not, I'm sure you're still paying for it. Um, and so it's just good to educate one another that you know, bottled water isn't the norm anymore. It's cool to drink tap water, you know, it's safe, you know, it's it not only environmentally friendly, but it saves you money and, you know, you might be healthier. Sure, you know, in some parts, uh, you might have to boil your water, but, um, you know, that the idea that mineral water has, you know, a higher status, you know, um, that really needs to be shot down. The media is responsible for a lot of that. And, you know, you, you shouldn't let that affect how you think about tap water. You should form your own opinion and not always listen to the media and, you know, make sure to educate your neighbors and your friends because that one-on-one -on -one interaction will have a bigger impact than what they see in an ad or on the bus or on the television. Yeah, I'd like to follow up with that. Uh, yeah, it did really turn into like a status thing here in America to walk around with a water bottle. <laughs> And the funny thing is, is we have perfectly good water here. I, I can understand if you don't have clean water at home that you had to provide some way to get clean water and perhaps you had to drink a bottle of water, but we don't need to do it here. It's, it's, we have, unless you're talking about certain areas around like Love Canal or something like that, most of the water here in America is, is, is pretty clean. Uh, and just this whole idea of, yeah, the norms are starting to change, but as activists, we have to turn that bottle of water into that sacred cow. We have to turn that hummer into that thing that people would point at that person and say, how could you drive around in something like that? It's, it's preposterous to, to use up that many resources as one person is ridiculous. and. Just this idea of changing the status quo of 
of, of status and looking at people and think that they have status because they drive around in a big car and they, they drink Avian and things like that, that, that uh, it's something that we don't want to aspire to and the change to culture here in America, in the Philippines, around the world as, a, as activists to really change things. And, and sort of off of what both of them said, um, corporations are out to make money. And we, I can see in car commercials that it used to be that you know there were tons of ads for Hummers and these big cars that got horrible gas mileage just because they looked cool. But activists have managed to convince people that we really do need to worry about um, how much gas we use. And now you see ads for cars like smart cars, and you know there's hardly ever an ad that doesn't at least give a car's miles per gallon. Um, it's something that people worry about now, and we can do the same thing with bottled water. If we make it so that it's not cool to drink bottled water and we convince people not to drink it, the companies are going to stop advertising it and eventually stop making it. So um, all that we've got to do is convince you know, our communities that it's not, all, it's not you know, the cool thing to drink. You know, if you can convince two people to go and convince two people, you know, then you can have a huge impact in the end um, on that, and that will stop those companies from producing it. Yeah, I'd like to follow up with that. Uh, there's a reason you guys are here. It's because you guys have shown, sh shined above other people and, and been lucky enough to get into this program, and I'm sure you're all really happy about it, but you worked really hard to do it. But now people are thinking, you guys are the smart, young, the youth of tomorrow, and believe me, when you go back, they're gonna wanna listen to you, they're gonna wanna hear what you have to say, and you're, you are our leaders of tomorrow, and this, this is the direction that, you know, that we hope the leaders of tomorrow are going to go as opposed to studying business and exploiting resources or going into the environmental activism and protecting them. Now I will go back to Alex and ask him, as a high school student, what has he done concretely in the, as an individual or with the organizations with which he is connected in school? Um, just with regards to bottled water or with regards to no, uh, environmentalism in general? Um, well, as, um, as a school organization, my school's environmental studies club has gotten um, a lot of water bottle refilling stations installed on top of water fountains at our school, which is a thing where you can put a water bottle underneath it and it fills it a lot faster than a water bottle and it really makes it a lot more convenient, which, um, which helps convince people to drink it more often. We've done a lot of roadside cleanup, and we've managed to really um, help make recycle a big push for recycling at Sycamore High School. Um, we pick up the recycling. Where did you do the roadside cleanup? Oh, we do it um, out on Peace Road, just around town, um, just anywhere. Was it like trip. one fun afternoon and it's done? <laughs> no, um, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> that, uh, you know, you could clean up litter once and no one would ever litter again. They would just say, oh, well, it's cleaned up. Um, but no, it's a continuing effort. It's a continuing effort. And then as an individual, um, I lobby with the Sierra Club, which means that I go to um, people who are part of the state legislator, and I talk to them about issues that are coming up with the environment. Because, you know, politicians, elected officials, um, they can be great allies, but they don't have time to read through every single bill on the environment or um, really on anything. So if you can help um, tell them um, <laughs> what's going to, um, what's going to benefit the environment and benefit the people that they work for, um, they're going to be a lot more likely to, um, to vote in a way that's friendly to the environment instead of saying, you know, oh, well, I don't know what's in this, and you know, some big business isn't a fan of it. But if you can show them that you really care, as one of their constituents, um, they're a lot more likely to vote for the environment. 
So we've learned a couple of lessons here. Number one, work with school administration, and Sarah said it might take five years or more, but you have to start it. And then Alex is saying, work with politicians too. You want to lobby, if you want to make changes, do it. And then thirdly, you yourselves have to do certain things like clean up, and it's not just one shot. It's continuing. Uh, and then I'd like to ask uh, first, Eric, you've been organizing concerts, and then you have theme relating to environment and uh, health. Could you tell us how you did it, why you did it, and how people got activated to join uh, do something related to the environment? Uh, yeah, actually, like watching the presentation today at lunch with dance and music, uh, I think it's one way that we can all find common ground that through dance and music and, and arts, that it really breaks down the barriers that we have between cultures. Uh, and then t this idea of you don't really have to like begrudgingly work for the environment. You can have a good time doing it. You can put on concerts or, or, or uh, whatever else, work with artists and musicians and things like that uh, to try to raise awareness. And what we've done is put on, there's a, there's a, a there's a coffee house in town called the House Cafe that we've probably put on about 10 shows now. Uh, we've worked with the Cal County Community Gardens, uh, Safe Passage, Domestic Abuse Agency here in town. Uh, Feed 'em Soup is a, uh, a soup kitchen, they call them. It's a, it's a place where people go for community meals. Uh, Hope Haven. Uh, a bunch of different organizations so every time we put on a show we try to do it for a charity so we split the door money half goes to the artists half goes to a charity and uh, it's a great way to get publicity as well that uh, and, and get the artists involved as well and also this idea of uh, people traveling in clicks that really try to get people out of their the normal people that they communicate with and and talk to other people because if we have an environmental group and we just meet once every two weeks with our little clique, 10 people and have our little bake sale and, and not really get a bunch of other people involved, it's really hard to get the word out there and, and gain momentum for a movement. Uh, so one of my mantras has been to do a good thing and have it while having a good time. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things that we've done is work with the community, work with students, uh, try to get faculty out to our events, which is almost impossible. <laughs> wink, wink. Uh, and, and just... <laughs> And just really kind of get out of your comfort zone to work with people that you're not used to working with. And, and you'd be surprised how, how those people will, will embrace you. And once you kind of get your name out there, that, out there that you're an activist, you'd be surprised how people will start uh, emailing you, uh, you know, sending you messages, would you like to get involved with this, that, that's basically how we got invited to this because I know Ray well because he's extremely active on campus and in the community. Um, and he just doesn't kick back on his laurels and, and talk about the stuff that he's, he has done because he's always has something, a next project in the works. And, uh, and I think that's important. And, and to get that out there in the community and work with the community and, and make that connection between academia and the community and really try to fill in the gaps of, of, of those things that are missing to, to uh, 
I don't know, if you want to think like the fabric of society, that to really put in a lot more fibers in there to get it to connect. And it's really a lot harder to tear it apart once, once it gets, once you kind of build that strength into it. Is it easy to organize a concert? No, it isn't. <laughs> Okay. Let's, uh, let's learn. Most, yeah, most, it, I, you know, when we do something like that, we try to give six months for prep uh, to really do it right. And uh, I'm not sure, like, where you're from, if there's opportunities to do things like that, if you have venues that you can approach uh, the manager of a coffee house or a different venue that could put on live music and things like that. But, uh, I think you'd be surprised how they really want to work with other people and not just concert promoters and things like that. The, the students have, that have formed environmental activism groups that come up with ideas that they want to put on a show to help raise awareness for things that are going on in the Philippines that uh, you find near and dear to your heart and, and you want to work on these issues. Because once you find an issue that you really you really attach yourself to and find that you really want to work on it, then it just turns into a labor of love. It's not really something that you begrudgingly do because it's, it's a job that you really have to do. So for me, putting on concerts and things like that is something I really enjoy doing, but I also see that it has an effect on the community and really does help raise awareness but also, more than that, to raise funds for these groups, such as a group like Safe Passage, that is a domestic abuse agency. Uh, you might not see the correlation to the environment, but I do, because uh, pe people's environments may be the houses that they're living in, and the communities that they're living in, things like that. To, to raise funds for some of these groups that, uh, that are not being protected or or uh, liaison through the government. These are actually 501c3 groups that are non-governmental groups that are doing the good work in our community. Okay. Um, some of you were thinking of doing a big concert in a big coliseum. Uh, just a reminder from a professional, Eric organizes a lot of concerts. There's a, as he mentioned, there's in town, there's a house cafe, a lot of good things happening. I don't go there, but when Eric invites me, you know, Facebook announcement, I go. Because he matches a concert with a cause. One day it's for battered women, another it's for a homeless, another day for the shelter, and so on, and then the environment. And at the same time, I learn a lot of things. That's also when I met by accident Sarah. I was saying, oh, this is a nice thing. I said, aren't you Ray? I said, aren't you Sarah? <laughs> so I've heard of her. She's heard of me. So we had a long chat. I, I kind of stole her that night. <laughs> I think other people say, are other people asking about environmentalism on your table? So I kind of left after a while. So I learned a lot by going to concerts. And Eric's mantra is really good. You might want to remember. Do a good thing and have a good time. Yes. Okay? So don't do something because I have to do this. Oh my goodness, the State Department. Jen told me I have to do it. <laughs> Follow up on the a project. Of course you do it, but have a good time. Okay? But something which is doable, something that is measurable, something which is achievable. Okay. And yeah. And also just this idea of if you notice somebody that's doing really good work, you, you just might want to say, I want to go work with these people. You know, I know in Southeast Asia, uh, there's there's a movement with Echo Buddhism now, that monks are ordaining trees, so the, the logging companies won't come and cut down the trees. And uh, for me, that is tremendously inspirational, work like that. So. Uh, yeah, just, just uh, I guess get out of your comfort zone or, or you do see people doing good work and you just want to attach it to that. You don't have to recreate the wheel, so to speak, that if, you know, just attach yourself to, to a group of, uh, 
of activists that are doing good work and, and get involved. Thank you. I would like to go back to Sarah now. Since you work at the recycling plant, tell us how it is like and what's being done. Like, who cares and why? Nobody cares. <laughs> That's how I feel sometimes. Um, I, I've worked for, with the university for about a year and four months now. And it seems like a long time when I say that, but it hasn't been that long. Um, I think of myself as trying to infiltrate the system in a way, because you know, um, a lot of these universities, they have sustainability offices, sustainability programs and initiatives and plans. And here at NIU, it was a small part of the president of the university's Vision 2020 plan. But we don't have any anyone overseeing that plan to make sure, hey, you know, we need to do this for sustainability. So when I started out with recycling, it was just to promote this competition called Recycle Mania, which is a national competition with colleges and universities to see over an eight-week period who can recycle the most or improve their recycling the most. And so that was fun, and then they decided I did a good job, and then I should stay on. <laughs> you guys will be seeing our facility on May 3rd, I believe, so excited to have you all there. Um, but one thing that I learned with um, within recycling is that, especially at large institutions like a university, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that you don't necessarily know or even care about, you know, like energy costs, water costs, how do you get your cooling and heating, you know, who picks up your garbage, where does your garbage go, how far does it travel, these are all things that I'm learning every day, like who's in charge of, you know, as Eric mentioned at the beginning, who's in charge of, you know, procurement, where do we buy our supplies from, um, electronics recycling is something big in my department right now, before last year, they didn't do anything with leftover electronics. And then Illinois made a state law that said you can no longer dispose of your electronic waste in the landfill. It needs to go through a certified electronics recycler. And the university at that time was only taking university property. So only computers and monitors that were bought by the university could be recycled through the university. And those would go and be put on pellets and stored for a long period of time and then they'd be shipped out to Springfield, they'd go to auction and who knows what happens after that. Um, so in our department we started a uh, just a free electronics recycling program that any student, faculty, staff, or community member could bring in their leftover unwanted, unworking electronics and we would recycle them in an environmentally friendly way with an e-certified R2 electronics recycler. They have to get all these certifications. Now we ran into the issue um, here at the university. There are some administrative problems and we're being watched under a microscope. And so now this program that we've worked for eight months trying to make feasible, and, you know, it's finally starting to work great. We have an awesome system. Now they come and they say, hey, you can't do that anymore. And so it kind of hurts, you know, see all that hard work that we put into, you know, be just shut down. Um, but we did learn from it. You know, we learned what, op what other options are out there. And although the university may not be able to do, take advantage of those options, this is something that maybe, you know, Sycamore High School could do, or, you know, maybe one of the smaller community colleges, or, or you know, we also developed a good working partnership with DeKalb County during that time, and now they have bi-weekly pickups, or bi-weekly drop-off locations for electronic waste. So it is like a living, learning, everyday type of thing, and my job has expanded to not just recycling anymore. Everyone thinks when I tell them my job is the recycling coordinator that I sit there and I sort cans from bottles and paper. And it's not like that at all. Um, a lot of my job has to do with educating students and telling them, hey, we do recycle. It's one of the hardest you know, rumors to hear on campus is that we don't recycle. Because I have the numbers to prove that we do. When I started 
a year and a half, a year and four months ago, we were recycling around 20% of materials, which means 20% of all things on campus were being recycled. Now we're up to about 45%, just from simple marketing and education, um, training our janitors better. And then we also switched over from a sorted system to where you know, we had to sort cans, bottles, and papers. So now it's single stream. So you can grow all recycling into one big bin, and then that, that creates jobs because then that has to be shipped over. To, it goes to Carroll Stream, which is not too far from here, and then they sort it there. So, you know, it's part of educating people like that. So now we just need to tell them what's trash and what's recyclable. Another huge thing that we did was labeling um, instead of garbage or trash, it now says landfill on our garbage cans. And that's to give people an idea that, hey, when you throw something away, it's not just out of sight, out of mind. It has to go somewhere, and it's going to that landfill. And landfills are filling up. Everyone knows that. It's a local issue here in DeKalb because they want to make um, a DeKalb County mega dump out of our landfill. And it's a huge issue. I'm not too familiar with it because I'm not a resident here, but I wish I was more familiar. Um, Um, with this student group, and this student group is working with um, 